Hello, and welcome to Fellowship Church Rouge Park. We are so glad you're here. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for joining us. We're going to read from verse 4 to 25. As last week, we covered chapter 1 and chapter 2, verse 3. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, And there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Hivla, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is onyx stone there. The name of the second river is Gishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the garden, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God took from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of men. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord, and we want to thank God for it. There are many seasons and occasions in our lives where me and you can easily slip away in our thoughts and begin to dream of a better world. Namely, to dream considering our circumstances, our situations. Some may dream about being part of a family that does not have so much hurt or disunity. Some may dream about having friends that don't talk behind their back. Some may dream about a workplace where it would be a delight to work and not a burden or dread. Couples may quietly dream about a spouse who would be more loving or more respectful. Kids may dream about parents who would care more and listen more. The freshly graduated student may dream about the career The single person may dream about their future spouse. Or the owner of the house may dream about one that doesn't have so many problems. You name it, the list goes on. 
we too easily dream of those better places. And it's no accident or coincidence that we do that because we live in a fallen world. We live in an imperfect world. But today's passage tells us about a perfect world, a world where we don't have to dream. Adam did not have to dream for something better. Everything given to him was a precious gift, perfect in every way. There was no lack, no longing for something better because everything in chapter 1, God says, was good. In fact, very good on the day where he finished creating everything in day 6. So here's the main point that I want to put for us to think through as we go through this chapter. That in the garden, God reveals himself as both a personal and a covenant-keeping God. That he's both personal and a covenant, meaning a promise-keeping God. And that's key for us to see. You see, last week when we opened up to Genesis 1, we saw the big story, the wide picture of God's creation. It focused on the cosmos. But today, as we go into chapter 2, we're still in the big story, but from a wide lens, this week we zoom in and we see life in the garden. The focus is the people. Last week it was the cosmos, this week in chapter 2, it's the people. You see, in Genesis 1, while God was making the cosmos, in Genesis 2, we're invited into the detailed work of the garden. Interestingly, it even becomes familiar in the names that's used to describe God. You see, in Genesis 1, it says God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word for that in the Hebrew was Elohim, God which really emphasizes him as creator of the universe. But in chapter 2, if you use a different name that builds on that, Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, revealing him as personal and a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. Big sovereignty, relational, promise-keeping, personal. That's what happens. It's one account, one and two, but we go from wide to a narrow, to an in-depth view. You see, the picture of covenant keeping is an important thing for us to understand throughout the Bible. It starts in Genesis, and the creation account is the first promise that God makes, that he's with them. But when that breaks, in chapter 6 of Genesis, God makes another covenant with Noah. And then he renews it again with Abraham in chapter 12. And then he renews it again with Moses. And then he renews it again with David. And then through Jeremiah, he tells them, guess what? There's a new covenant that I want you to look forward to. And ultimately, that covenant, that promise that God makes is realized in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So God is a covenant-keeping God, and it begins right here in Genesis. So how does this passage reveal to me and you Yahweh as the one who's both personal and promise-keeping. Because we're covering the entire chapter, I want us to see that I think this text primarily focuses on three things. And here are the three things that we're going to look at. The man and his home, the man and his task, the man and his wife, his companion. So without further ado, let's look at that. Number one, the man and his home. We see that really from verse 4 to 14, and it begins with the generations of heavens and the earth, and they were created. And in that day, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. You know, this verse 4 actually presents the same idea, but it's interesting. When you look at the, the nuances a little bit, it says in the first line, when they were created, the cosmic creation of the universe. But in the second line, it says, when the Lord God made, conveys the personal relational aspect the Lord God, the promise-keeping God. Even in that very verse, you see both aspects of that. See, it's in that place where man and his creator begin to commune and establish a relationship. They establish that relationship right there. In verses 5 and 6, we see God provide water in order for food to grow so there will be essentials for the life of the man the animals, and the creature. God is providing all things necessary for life. 
and prosperity. You see, then we turn to verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. In this verse, we see that God formed man out of dust. Some uh, versions say dirt. And then he breathed life into him. Just think about that. Think about how personal that is. You know, when you were a kid or even now, if there's something stuck in your eye, I remember my mom would just blow in my eye and it's, you got to be right there. God is right there in a, in, a, in a being that's not alive yet. And he was breathing and creating life, physical, mental, and spiritual, all in one breath. Because this man is made in his image. He's to bear his image. Derek Kidner in his commentary says, this was an act of giving as well as making. God gave and God made. Genesis 1 tells us that of all creation, only man is made in the image of God to represent him in all of the world, in all of creation, by ruling it in good and gracious ways, by being God's representatives. You see, it is the perfect father-son relationship, both in care and in providence. Look with me to verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. This is Adam's home, his dwelling place. He did not work for it or earn it. It was a completely free gift. It was paradise. Paradise. You know, we talk these days about man cave, men who will do their basements up and, well, this is the perfect man cave right here, guys. Adam lacked nothing, nothing at all. You see, not only did he create him, he put him there. Adam didn't discover it. You know what awaited in the garden for Adam? Great discoveries. Great discoveries awaited him because God made all of this as he seeks to rule the whole world in gracious ways. You see, this garden was not just a place for Adam to live and enjoy it, but it was also the place of the presence of God. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, we see that in the cool of the day, the Lord God was walking in the garden. God is present with him. It is a sacred place. You see, it's a foreshadowing of the future temple. It's a foreshadowing that God will be present with us forever through His Holy Spirit. But in this time, the garden is a sacred place because the Lord God walked among them in the cool of the day. In essence, one can conclude that the first home given to Adam and Eve was a holy place, a sanctuary, where the presence of God was very real. So the Lord God took Adam by hand and guided him. God guided him and walked him through and showed him, all of this is yours, Adam. The identity, showing him his home, giving them details on how to carry out his commission given in chapter 1. Be fruitful and multiply. You see, we see this in verse 9, that nothing was missed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that was pleasant in the side and good for food. Everything necessary for life was given and ready, more than he could have imagined. In the same verse, there's a special mention of two types of trees. A lot of talk about this. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge and good of evil. And nothing more is mentioned about these trees until verse 16 again. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, there is a lot of debate, and there continues to be, about what kind of fruit tree this might have been. Apple, orange, we don't know. And I think there's a place and time to talk about that. But we must not miss the point when we come to this passage. That God did not give us the name of the particular tree, but he gave Adam a clear command to obey regarding the tree. 
We must see that. They listen. We may not know the details of it, but there's a clear command that's set before him. And the command is this. Do not eat of this tree. If you do, death awaits you. You ever went to a place that says do not enter, only authorized personnel? This is the do not, do not eat. Do not eat. Four words. Because if you do, death enters you. This is the first ethical category of good and evil that Adam is given. Do not. Between good and evil. God created the tree to teach the man and the woman the difference between right and wrong. So God wants them to learn to obey him and his commands. You see, something else is here. God was discipling Adam in the garden, teaching him to lead. You know what the tree offered? It offered an alternative to discipleship. Instead of learning from God, be self-made. Wrestle with your own knowledge. Satisfy and have your own values in defiance to the Creator. That's what that was. You see, the type of tree may not be clear, but what is made clear is the outcome of disobedience. For on that day, you shall surely die, verse 17. So the lesson is clear. Adam, this is your home. This is paradise. Let me disciple you. Obey what I teach you, and you will surely prosper and multiply and make my name known throughout all the world. But if you disobey, there's no half-stepping. Death awaits you. Now, our homes are not Eden. We all know that, right? We know that. But it is the place where me and you are most ourselves, right, in our homes, at work, we have to have a certain hat on. At school, certain hat on. Social gathering, certain hat on. Maybe when you're playing sports. But at home is when we are most ourselves. Our homes should also be a place, as we see from Eden, where we should seek the presence of God, where we should seek family worship, Spontaneous prayer and praise. We should seek it to be clean and hospitable for sure. I think that's a blessing. But the most consistent person in the presence we ought to seek in our homes is the Lord God Himself, Yahweh Elohim, who's personal and promise keeping. And as Christ followers, we need to cultivate that that he may be found in our prayer, in our praise, in our conversation, and most importantly, that God may be found in our pain. Because we live in a sinful world, pain will come to every family. And when it does, to whom will we turn? And to whom will we point each other? For Adam, he had the Lord in his home. God gave it to him. God has given us our own home, and what we do there matters. Having shown Adam his home, the Lord God is going to explain to him how he used to take care of this. And that's our second point. The man and his task is made clear, namely in one verse, 15. Not only did the Lord create him and put him in this exquisite garden, but he gave him a task to carry out. It was first mentioned in 128, be fruitful and multiply. Now he gets the details. Look with me to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. It's very short. To work it and keep it. The word work gives a meaning of preparing and tending. Preparing and looking after. Notice the command to work is given to Adam before he sinned. Some have even gone as far as saying that the idea of work must have been a result of sin. But I think that's just laziness talking and not the Scriptures. The Lord God gave Adam the task of working while he was still sinless. It wasn't something to be avoided, but it was joyful obedience, work. See, productive work is part of God's good purpose for man in creation, that God had created us that way, that we are to work. 
In fact, when we through throughout the Old Testament, we find the same words of working, of how the priestly order is described, that they worked, that they, that they took these responsibilities in the temple to serve God. So the man's role is not only to be a gardener, but also a guardian. A gardener and a guardian. Adam is given the priestly leadership to guard and to care for the garden and soon for his wife. And if that wasn't enough, Adam was also given the work, I should add, fun work, to naming every living creature. We see that in verse 19 and 20. I can't imagine the lineup this must have cost in Eden. Can you think of it? Every animal lined up for him to name? Safe to say it's the first naming convention in all of history where Adam sat there and he named every animal. Whatever Adam named it, God did not change it. It was Adam's responsibility to care and to name them and to rule over them in gracious ways. But also, by naming them personally, Adam is knowing them personally. He knows them by name. Isn't that interesting? That Adam had to name those who were created because he was ruling over them. Let's not forget that God knows all of us by name. Adam just named them, but God created us. From the beginning, he knows us. We are no strangers. The theology of work included this for him. Stewardship can be found all the way in the garden before sin entered the human heart. It was a joyful responsibility. And it is where he fulfills his purpose. So part of, for us, the application is that our responsibilities in work, for those of us who follow Christ, is that we do it unto the Lord because work is something that God had created for us. It's part of our plan and purpose to live out, to bring glory to his name and to be a blessing to others. The man in his home, the man and his work, his task, brings us to our last observation before we look at some implications. The man and his wife, everything is moving towards this. In this chapter, it's moving towards this. Verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Adam is alone. The man cave was not enough for him. He's alone. All the animals naming them, not enough for him. He's alone. Not that he's alone in the sense of that God is not with him, but there's no one in the garden that he can relate to as a human being. He's naming the animals. He's done all of that. And in him, God created this thing to know that he's alone. In fact, Adam didn't even realize it, but God sees it. Once Adam was finished naming all the animals, it says in verse 20, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So God put him to sleep. He put him to sleep. A deep sleep fell upon him, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it up its place with flesh. And the Lord and God took the rib that the Lord God had taken from Adam and made it into a woman and brought her to the man. Notice it was Adam, it was God, not Adam, who knew that it was good for him not to be alone. God is all-knowing. It was God who honed into Adam's awareness of his need for having him provide a name for every living creature so that he would become aware that there was no helper for him, no helper. And it was God who caused a deep sleep upon Adam and removed his ribs he took those ribs while it was moist with fluids and warm with his marrow and his DNA and literally built that rib into a woman. Next time you have a piece of rib, just think about that scene. He literally took it while it was moist and God built it into a woman. And then it was God, like any earthly father, who presented her to him. 
What was Adam's reaction to all of this? Well, we know that Adam named the animals, but it is here. But those, that, that, that interaction is not recorded in the Bible. But it is here, in this chapter, where we are given the first words that a human spoke. That was recorded words. It was done in a wonderful way. It is the moment where he beheld his wife that God had made for him. Verse 23, And the man said, This at last is the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. So I sat there thinking about this, trying to picture this scene. Almost impossible. All of a sudden, I was reminded of the song, At Last. Now, I'm not going to even try to sing that. <laughs> At last, my love has come along. My lonely days are over, and life is like a song. Only, it wasn't Etta James who was singing it. It was Adam with the manly voice looking at Eve and said, at last, she's here. Adam restated his own name and embedded it into the woman's. As he saw her, he saw the mirror of himself with, of course, some agreeable differences. But he saw that, and he found his companion and his long love, long for love. You see, he was no longer alone such intimacy, and all of it was from God. All of it. It is here we see the first wedding ceremony. And as they get married, and Adam pronounces this, God makes a pronouncement in verse 24 and 25. He says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Remember in chapter 1, verse 28, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. For Adam and Eve, it is God's creation plan to raise up faithful children who will further extend their reach over the earth and be representatives of God. Now, in the 21st century, as more and more people are moving into the cities, as more and more people are working harder, uh, trying to earn a living, as a morality keeps on changing, it has become more common for married couples to have children either later in life or decide not to have them at all. Often the reason is fear. But sometimes people have even confessed to me there's also fear of losing their comfortable lifestyle. Adam and Eve had the perfect home, the perfect home, but they didn't worry about it. I know we live on the other side of the garden now. Let me show you an advertisement that was recently put up in UK by an agency, and this is what it said to women, would you give up this, high heels and lipstick, for this, a soother? I couldn't find the other picture, but the other picture was... Uh, a Nintendo gaming, and it said, would you give up this, the gaming, for men, for the soother? You see, it's out there. I was shocked when I saw that. But it's constantly telling us, either don't have kids, and if you do, don't have too many. You're killing the earth. There's all kinds of messages out there. But God had one command for the first couple, be fruitful and multiply in the context of marriage between a man and a woman. You see, the world wants young people, especially when they're single, to buy into this concept that, by, that the being married and having children will infringe upon your life and the enjoyment of your life. So stick to the heels and lipstick or stick to the gaming and your freedom. You don't have to worry about all of this. It's interesting that it happens in Britain Britain has not even covered their replacement level. More people are dying than born in Britain. And we're not much behind them. But it's interesting that all of these things are happening. But God says that in His perfect plan of creation, it is His will and plan for us to pursue marriage and family. You see, 
in the last little bit, I've been asked even by just people who want to understand this better, what about us who are Christ followers? Is it okay when we are married and not desire children? My answer is pretty simple. Either we obey God or not. It is God's ability to give or not. We have to trust Him with that. But to know the plan of God in creation, in His plan in marriage, and then to say, no, I don't want to have children, is to actually, quite frankly, be selfish and be afraid and not take in what God has to say to us. The God who made the cosmos and the God who made us in His image has a plan, and that is be fruitful and multiply. It doesn't say, now, if you want, if it doesn't infringe upon your comfort lifestyle, be fruitful and multiply. It says be fruitful and multiply. But to take it upon oneself and declare that they will not seek to have children is to reject the plan and the commandment of God in marriage. Sometimes I know affluence and comfort have a way of blinding us to God's plans and purposes. Having said this, Genesis 2 ends in harmony between God and creation, between God and human beings, between man and woman, and between the couple and creation. All is in unity. All is beautiful. And for that, we give praise to God. But as we live here and now, after, outside the garden, we know life is not the same. That is the perfect world. You see, in Genesis 1 and 2, we see that our own biological makeup tells us that there are only two genders, man and women, that God had innately created it and purposeful in our creation. But today we live in a time where a new ideology of sex and gender is changing the landscape. You see, God in His Word made it very clear. But our world has made it confusing, almost non-recognizable. Ultimately, it comes down to our worldview. We may come here with a number of different worldviews, but we look to God's Word to say, what does He have to say? If He is the one who created the cosmos and created me and you in His image, who's all-powerful and all-knowing, we ought to give Him our attention to what He says about this. We live in a time where sexual revolution, as we know it, began actually after Genesis 3 in the fall. But in the last 20 plus years, the changes that have happened is nothing short of astonishing. In our lifetime alone, Playboy magazine in Hollywood has relentlessly promoted a sexuality that has become normal outside of marriage, outside of that promise, the covenant that men and women make, outside of a relationship between a biologically born man and women. In Ontario, our health card, you don't have to identify as male or female, you can choose X. On our birth certificate, you can choose X. On our passports, in the near future, you can choose X to identify with a different or, or non-identifying gender. You see, no previous generation in human history has heard about anything like this. No human history. But it's happening. It's coming in waves. And we're not to be angry or, or people are not our enemies, but we need to be mindful of the ideologies and the worldviews out there. Our universities and colleges are a breeding ground for these things. And that's why we need to know the God of the Bible. There are stories that have come out, even this past week, a news article, that parents, some parents are choosing not to identify the biological sex of their child because they want their child to grow up on their own and choose what they feel is best for them. Their response was that it would be unloving for them to segregate them to that biological sex. And they say they're doing a great thing for the child, giving them total freedom. But God would say that's confusing the child and that's laying down our responsibilities as men and women in helping them understand that and nurturing them in that. And every time I see or read this article or things like that, I'm astonished at how we approach this. We won't let our kid cross the street by themselves, but we will let them choose their gender. Just think about the logic, but that's again, 
The God of the Bible has a lot to say about this. Here's the thing we need to be mindful of that. That God created men and women, Adam and Eve, as he beheld her. Adam was not worth more than Eve. They were equal in worth, value, and dignity, but distinct in their roles. Distinction is something that God made in our creation. And that's beautiful. It's to be celebrated. It's to be thanked God for. And nothing less. Because he's the God who personally made us and cares for us. If you're not a Christ follower, friend, the God of the Bible is personal and keeps his promise. And he wants you to know about that promise that has been fulfilled in Jesus. Namely, that he came to this confusing world, to this world that is broken because of sin. And he wants to restore me and you to the one who's made in the image of God, that you could know him and abide in him and be his representative in this world. That you don't have to live life on your own terms, that God wants you to turn from that and look to him. We live on the other side of eating that fruit from that tree of good and evil. Spiritual death had begun, but Christ has come to pay for that price so that me and you can now have life. So friend, I pray and I hope that you would want to investigate the claims of the gospel. Know the person and the message of Christ and come to know Him and believe in Him. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would draw your heart to this reality. Do not just buy any worldview out there. Test it to see if it's legitimate. You know when somebody's trying to sell you a Rolex for a hundred bucks, it's not real. Don't settle for that hundred dollar Rolex when God has something that's infinitely more valuable in the gospel, in the person, in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those of us who are Christ followers, let me speak to the brothers first. The one flesh intimacy in marriage is a gift from God. Men, we need to understand that we are to be keepers of this intimacy, rooted in the very act of creation. It's such a high calling. But there is more, because in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul concludes his teaching on marriage by saying this, the two shall become one flesh, and this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Our one flesh intimacy was a creational picture of intimacy of Christ and the church. It doesn't just stop with us. It's not but me and you ultimately, but it's through us, us pointing to Christ and the church. Therefore, all who name the name of Christ must understand that the relationship between a man and his wife is meant to be a window, a window to the relationship between God and his bride, the church. It doesn't just stop with us. We're conduits of the message of the gospel. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is to preach the gospel to our hearts. To our sisters, a helper fit for him. You're not just a worker. Adam praised God when he saw Eve. She complimented him. He was alone. One would think that Adam was given dominion over creation and access to all the glory of God's handiwork, and you would think it would be enough, but it was not enough. Something wasn't quite right. There was something incomplete and unfinished about Adam's existence, namely the woman, Eve, who is equal in worth, in value, and in dignity. And he created you as distinct from Adam with a glorious purpose, not with a lesser purpose, with a glorious purpose. We should not see distinction as a lesser purpose, but glorious. On the one hand, the woman is made in the image of God, whether married or not. At the same time, a husband and wife are made for one another. They are to be lifelong companions, best of friends, united in the covenant, the promise that God makes. But there is no greater message in marriage. Remember this, that our marriages point to Christ and the church, that we are a display of the gospel ultimately. All of biblical history from creation to Adam and Eve to Revelation point us to Christ and his bride. Everything is to serve this one goal, to glorify God 
as Jesus secures his bride in the church and glorifies the Father. To the less, to the yet to be married, my last point, let me be clear about this. Marriage is not required for a fulfilling life. Marriage is not required for a fulfilling life. There are some whom God gives as a gift of singleness. We read that in 1 Corinthians. But that is the exception and not the norm. We must not claim that for ourselves. We might allow God to grant that to us. It's not something I pluck and say, I decide to do this. The Lord Jesus himself was single. The Apostle Paul, Timothy, a number of people are considered to be single. As meaningful as marriage is, what brings you supreme fulfillment in life is not knowing and being loved by another human being, but knowing and being loved by God. When we grasp that, marriage does become meaningful if the Lord has that for our lives. It is not. I know it. I remember battling through that feeling. Oh, if I just... But just, it was really the moment where I, said, where I surrendered that desire of marriage to the Lord and where God taught me to love and appreciate Him more, that He actually brought my wife into my life. It was, that, it was a turning point. So I want to encourage you, as you see this passage, sometimes like, oh, Adam was given this, what about me? If you're not married, your greatest fulfillment ultimately still is in Jesus. So as we creep on preaching this to our hearts, we must also faithfully declare it to others and to trust that the Holy Spirit will bring about conviction and encouragement and help us seeking that God's plan is perfect and beautiful and is only redeemed and secured in Jesus. Let's pray.